church. We're glad you all took time out of your life today to be here to worship with us. You go kind of back in time. I heard some people tell me the other day, they said, we come out and visit church, it's kind of like we step back in time. And I said, well, there's a lot of old timers here. Said, okay, that's probably a good one. But anyway, I'm glad y'all are here today. It's about time. Here's our furthest visitor today. Right here, New York City. Get my hand. Yeah, you was right on that Texas one. You see me about two hours. That's right. Uh, Jesse and his dad there. Very glad to have him today. So anyway, well, if you're here today, I hope you stop by the truck wagon over there, the welcome wagon. See Miss Charlene over there. Is she what? What's that word? Oblivion? I heard she was oblivion. Isn't that what you said? Two pounds and one pound bag. <laughs> You never know what kind of words you're going to hear at Barnum Cowboy Church. I guess he's saying you're a handful. She's probably the friendliest gal you ever meet. That's why the Lord put her here at the chuck wagon to be our welcome wagon. If you did stop by there this morning, please stop by there so we can get a record of your visit today. And the great thing is that card will go into our office and our office staff will send a card to you to see how we can help you. See if there's any questions you have about our church or if you need to make contact with me, the pastor of the church. And that's a great ministry. How many of y'all like that ministry we're doing there at our office? Isn't that a great ministry? So, Miss Kimberly Ann, you do a great job there helping us out with all that. But if you are visiting today, I will let you know there are exits at both ends. I'm supposed to do that every week according to the building code stuff. And I tell everybody in case Bob sings too long or I preach too hard, you can get out either way. And there are restrooms around the corner down there. Just watch the. Did you all see the stairway to heaven when you come around the corner? It should be white or blue instead of red. I won't talk much about the red. But anyway, it's there. They, they get you out of here. I, I want to put a sign on it. There's only one way to heaven. And uh, if you hit your head, you may find it. So, you all right, Ron? Okay, I thought he fell down. I thought Ron fell down behind the bleachers. Yeah. Stacy, you never know what's going to happen here. It's a lively bunch. So, but anyway, I'm glad you guys are here. Right now, would you stand with me? Let's keep this service going today as we give thanks to our Lord today for Jesus Christ. We do have a lot going on this week. Brother Rick will do the announcements at the end of the service. Right now, let's just focus on how great God is today. Isn't God good? Yes. How many of y'all are glad that you're just know Jesus today? Isn't there, there's nothing else there. So right now, let's practice our faith as a church, and let's come to corporate prayer. And here in a moment, we'll open up the altars for prayer for healing and sickness, whatever there is, just like James 5. We do that every week. We get ready to do that. If you're visiting, I'll explain that, why we do that. But I'll tell you what, how many of y'all have seen God do miracles at these altars when we pray for people? We've seen God do it. I mean, if he says to do it, if you believe God's word, you've got to do it. Amen. You're right? So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we approach thee, O Lord, with confidence that we can enter into your throne room today boldly because of Christ. That, Father God, that we have a high priest who does sympathize with us because we live in a fallen world. But through Jesus Christ, we can enter into your presence with confidence that you hear us, you accept us. And so, Father, we come to you and we pray right now for our country here in America. We ask that, Father God, that you bring holiness back to America. We pray for all the victims of war around the country today. We pray for the Ukraine people, all the injustice that's just going on around the world. We pray for your church all over this world today, Father God, that your people would stand strong in faith. And, Father God, give us strength to do what is right according to your word, not what feels best to our flesh. And so, Father, as we are in this service today and as we go out about our community this week, May we be the ambassadors for Christ, the light of the world. And while we're here today, may we be encouraged. May we encourage one another and love one another as you have loved us. Ask your blessing on this service today on these people. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. Turn around and tell somebody you love them this morning. You're glad to see them. Brother Hobbs, here they are. Number 67. <laughs>
now this is probably my favorite time of service when we take time to give thanks to the one who made this all possible as we come together as a church and practice our belief and faith and prayer. And I believe God can handle anything, don't y'all? I believe that God can change our country back, don't y'all? I believe God can change us if we need him. What would it take for God to change one of us? Would it be just someone to say yes? Yes, Lord, I give in. I think, yeah, I bet we give God a migraine sometimes, don't y'all? Because he probably gets like them hard-headed cowboys over there. So that's what we're now doing. Elders, if you'd come down and get ready, we'll get ready to take on this time of prayer, heal for the, pray for the sick, for healing. And uh, we've got several people on our prayer list. Will somebody bring that prayer list to the altar today and pray over those people for us? And, and remember Dave and Cheryl? Cheryl's uh, had foot surgery. They're not here today at church. They are watching. And they need to pray for Cheryl because she's probably having to put up with Dave. I'll do that in for you, Cheryl. And, uh, and so, uh, but just uh, a lot of prayer needs today. I had an old boy tell me the other day, I said something about, we need to pray for our president. They said, which one? I know some of you still hanging on Trump, some don't like Biden. But right now, what's in the White House is President Biden. We need to pray for him. We need to pray for our, we need to do what the Word of God says. We need to pray for those who abuse us and use us and spitefully persecute, all these things. We need to pray. And so how many of y'all believe in the power of prayer? How many? Well, I want to see you do it today. You know, uh, I was born in Missouri, even though I'm an Okie. And, you know, we over there, we'll say, show me, right? Show me. Show me that you believe it. Let me see you do something. Kind of like in mules. That mule jump that fence. Show me. That's how they have Missouri mules. So, will you join me in prayer as we come together? We're going to open up the altars and do what James 5 says fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If there's anyone among you who are sick, we are to call upon the elders of the church that are to lay hands upon the sick and anoint their head with oil. Their prayer of faith will heal the sick. Is what Scripture says. And so I believe God's Word is true. Amen? Amen. So Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we're going to practice our faith. We believe that you are the great physician. We believe that God, that there's nothing impossible for you. Now all things work together for those who, to good for those who love you. And so, Father, we're going to open up the altars. We're going to come and, and give our offerings at this altar. Some of maybe we may be here today giving up junk in our lives to you. I pray, Father, if there's one here right now that has not received Christ as their Lord and Savior, bring them down, Father. They can do that right now because it's you that does it, not us. And so, Father, move upon this congregation in our obedience to your will. And we pray for one another. We trust you for healing. And we ask you, Lord, for your power and your provision upon us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brother Bob's going to lead us in amazing grace. If you believe in that grace, you can stand and sing. You can sit. But I'd like to see you come to the altar as we pray and ask for God for help today. Would you come? Brother Bob. <laughs>
pray in church. Amen. Amen. We do believe in the power of prayer. If you'll open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to continue in our teachings today on the uh, the message of what what is this a powerful message is. Last week we saw where the Philistines uh, wanted to get rid of the ark of God because they just wanted to get back to their life. We talked about how many times in our own lives God's presence really gets upon us and instead of changing and making the adjustments in our lives that we need to, to be able to stand in that presence with God, we try to figure out a way of escape by kicking God out. And you know, all across the country today, we see where people are just trying to get away from the presence of God because they're not willing to repent of their sins. We are seeing revival break out in areas of the world today. All over the world, we see a little lights of revival. And that's because people are making the adjustments. They're coming to the understanding of God and who He is and what His Word says about obedience to His life. Choices that He gave us to live by, not what we want to live by. The Philistines, I, I, knowing who God is, the Philistines could have come to a place and just said, we surrender. They could have just done that. I mean, they had cancerous tumors all over their body. They, they had rats running all over town. We saw that last week. And all they could think of was, let's get rid of this God instead of let's change. And I think that's what happens to so many people today that when we get the truth of who God really is, not this mythical creation that we created, through some kind of religious formats or whatever, we get to see that this God today that we're reading of here in the Bible is still the same God today. He does, he's never changed. And we're going to look at something even stronger today than what we saw with the Philistines yesterday as he goes into a country of people who get part of it right, but they don't get it all right. And so where God is going with this, I, I've been in prayer and where we're going to eat, we're going to be in this on Easter Sunday. There's a message that's coming right out of this that just goes right along with Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. We're going to go right down through this. And so right now, my focus is, if we look at chapter 6, I'm going to begin with verse 13 and I'm going to go through verse 20. But I want you to look at verse 20. Because that's where I'm just going to open up with a thought. It says, Who is able? To stand before the Holy Lord God. Who is able to stand before the Holy Lord God? Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we ask that, Father God, that you just give us understanding of your word today. That this is your holy word, as powerful and sharper than a double edged sword, and it's true. And, Father God, you're the same God here as you are today, right now in our lives. And I pray that, Father God, I do you proud today I, that, I just, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be solely acceptable to you, O Lord, for you are my strength and you are my Redeemer. And we give you all the praise in this house today for Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So as we get into this message today, I'm just going to read it. It's like every Sunday you come here, I don't have any notes. I just I, I, I diagram my verses when I read them. I, I put marks in it, so I've got some little cheap notes. I put little thoughts here about what this word means and stuff. But really, I just to be honest, to be truthful, I like to be just trying to let the Spirit of the Lord lead me every time we get into the Word of God. So it says, Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. Now remember what happened last week is that they got the two milk cows, they separated the calves from it, they built this wagon, they put the Ark of the Covenant of God on it, and they sent it out, and they said, watch where it goes, because it's going to mean something. They put the golden tumors in it, they put the golden rats in it, thinking they'd be healed. And last week I asked you a question, did you see anywhere where it says they got healed because they did those things? No. So I don't know if they got healed or not. All they wanted to do was get this presence of this Most High God of Israel out. And I loved it last week as we discovered that they even knew the story of this Most High God of Israel before the Ark of the Covenant was ever built. Because they asked the question, why are you, why are you hardening your hearts like the Egyptians did? They knew the story of Moses standing up to Pharaoh, let my people go. 
And now this very presence that delivered Israel is in their midst. All their gods have fell on the ground, broke off its head and hands, and all they can think about is, let's get this out of here because it's disrupting my way of life. And that's what's wrong with us. Is we want God to do partial things in our lives, but we're not willing to let Him change our lives for His glory. We don't want to change to live honorable. We want to change. We want the blessings of heaven with our feet still walking in hell because we enjoy our sin. And God says you can't have it both ways. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You can't have sweet water and a bitter water in the same fountain. You're either born of God or you're not. A lot of people saying, well, I said that prayer, preacher, and I ain't got dumped in that tank. But your life hasn't changed. You must repent of your sins. These people had an opportunity. I mean, just think about it. You know, I'm a big Blackaby guy. And I love, you know, I got to spend time with him and Richard a little bit with the mission board. But the thing that I always loved about it is he always talked about the experiences day by day that we can have with God. And I think about the experience the Philistines here had with God. Woo, it shook them up, didn't it? It changed their household. So much, instead of receiving it, they rejected it. Some of us in here are probably at the same place. You're rejecting some truths about God because you're not willing to pay the cost for what it is to follow Jesus with all your heart. Every one of us in here want to go to heaven. Nobody wants to go right now. As old Kenny Chesney made millions of dollars singing that song. But are you really going? Have you deluded yourself to the thought of desensitizing yourself to the Word of God by living in sinful ways? You desensitize yourself to the truth that are you really going to be one who inherits the kingdom of God or you just think that you should because you did something? Well, what about what God's done? I had a guy tell me one time, you know, I've been in the cowboy life for years. I've met with a lot of rough cowboy guys, a lot of rough characters. And this one cowboy said, well, preacher, I've done this and this and this. And I said, but what has God done? Well, God still has to forgive me all the time. I said, where does it say that he has to? Well, God so loved the world. And I said, you took that verse completely out of context. I said, what about John 14, 23? If you all know me very well in this church, that's one of my power verses. It says, and God will love him. Then you look at him. Who's the subject there? The one who keeps his word because he loves God. Does God love you as an individual? Well, do you love him? You know, the, the greatest marriage counselor in the world is God's word. Because I'm to love my wife as he loves the church. Wow. How did Jesus love the church? He gave us very life for it. But do I love him? Peter, do you filio? Or Peter, do you agapal? Do you agape? Do you love me the way I love you? So many of us want the benefits. It's kind of like going to work for a job and only working half the day and expecting full day's pay. That's, that's the watered-down Christianity we have today. Bonhoeffer said it's called cheap grace. And so as we understand these people, what they could have had, now they send it away. It goes to a group of, believe, or a people of God here. They're out there in our wheat harvest of the, and they're out there getting their wheat gathered up. And they lifted their eyes, verse 13, and they saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Wow! Look! Now remember, it's been gone for seven months. It's been gone for seven months because of bad choices from Eli and his two sons who didn't walk right with God even though they represented God. But they represented not the God of that we know. They represented a false God to the people. Your witness of who you say God is displays to others who they think God is. And when we tell people that you can continually sin because God must forgive you, what kind of God is that? 
that's not the God of the Bible because we can actually come back with Scripture and say, should they continue in sin because grace covers it up? He said, God forbid. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? For the wages of sin is death. So I, this, I've been around this church stuff since 1996 in ministry, and I've seen us go a slippery slope. We'll do everything we can to get you here in the world, but we don't really want to tell you everything. When I was a church planter, I was thinking about this the other day. I was hoping to I remember something black would be taught us. And another guy in church planting with Kansas Nebraska Association, they said the way you start a church is the way you have to maintain it. Because if you start a church without the foundational structures of Christ, and you bring that foundation in, it turns it upside down and blows it up. <laughs> But if you start a church on the foundation of Christ, anything that tries to come against that will be destroyed. Because you've got to lay the foundation first. A lot of churches don't put the foundation first. They put the entertainment and everything else down. And then when the foundation comes in, it causes a big blow up and the church blows apart. Because not start on the foundation. Well, these people here that see it are supposed to be foundation people of God. Look at verse 14. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Bethshemish and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Boy, this looks great, doesn't it? Man, fine. The Levites, oh, here we go, took down the ark of the Lord. You remember how they had to do that? Let's say this is the ark. Of course, it's not this big. They had these ringlets and they slide the rails in it and only the Levites can pick it up. So they take it off that cart and they set it down. Doing everything good. Look what happens. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it. The chest was full of the offerings, remember? The rats and the cancers, the sores. And which were the articles of gold and put them in a, on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord. One of Ashdod, one of Gaza, one of Ashkelion, one of Gath, and one of Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging, belonging to the five lords. Both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel, on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemosh. So it looks like everything's great. Then, there's that word. After all this happened, something took place. That's what then means right here. Then, God struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 of the people and the people lamented because the Lord has struck the people with a great slaughter. This God of Israel is terrible, isn't he? Everywhere he goes, he kills everybody and he causes problems. If God is such a great God, why do so many bad things happen to good people? You ever wonder? It's because we live in a fallen world. And the choices we make, God cannot change from bringing forth the circumstances of what He said He would do. Atheists say, if there's truly a God, why is why is so many bad things happen to these good people? Why is there so much evil in the world if God is so good? Because of a choice. Everybody blames God. You know, Adam, everybody says Adam blamed his wife. But actually, he blamed God because he says, because of the woman you gave me. He actually blamed God that day. And you see what they're at, where that led him. Many of us are in the situations we're in today because we won't take responsibility to live upright before God. We don't believe that we have to obey God. We believe that I've been saved because I said a prayer. There's no magic potion words in prayers. There's only God and repentance and you've got to come to Him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Psalms 55 talks to us clearly that that's the sacrifice that God is looking for is that broken heart and that contrite spirit. 
He wants you to come to a place and humble yourself to his feet and break yourself. Let him break you you're completely down to him and cry out that sin and allow him to fill your heart with the love that he has that surpasses all that understanding that you don't that you're fight that you're fighting all the day. You're fighting everyday stuff in your life. Because you just don't want to give up. You know, I trained horses for years. And training horses is just like pastoring a church. And you know what? Some of you just need the round pin bigger and longer than some. But the first thing a horse does when you put it in the round pin, he looks to try to how to get out. And as you work him and disengage his hindquarters and you try getting him to give you two eyes and instead of two heels, God does the same thing with you. He's going to do things in your life to try to get you to look at him instead of turning your back to him. Because we turn our back to Him because we don't want to see the truth of our own selves. Because when you look in the eyes of the Lord, you see yourself in the reflection. You see what He died for. He died for sinners. And we are sinners that need to come to Christ. And until we come to Him with all of our heart, halfway is not going to get it. See, they got half of it right here. But like us, we try to get into a place, I think, I look at this, and, I, and there's so many things I could go with this. About how men take positions that they shouldn't. About how men be, take ministries that they shouldn't. They, you're, you shouldn't have took that ministry. You should. There's things that we do that we shouldn't do. That you're not called of God to do. And we do nothing but cause more problems sometimes in our own lives. We try to take shortcuts with God. We try to do this because of God. We tell somebody something different than what God says. And God says, I can't tolerate that. But the one thing that I see, when they opened up that ark and looked into it, God said no. And the choice of these few men destroyed over 50,000 people's lives. Do you ever figure the choices we make, what it does to our families and people around us? <laughs> Seeing kills. He struck 50,070 men. Now, I know right there there was about 50,000 people looking in that ark at one time. But the effect of a few men's bad choice destroyed a multitude of people. Isn't that something? And I got people today saying, well, God doesn't allow anything bad to happen in our lives. <laughs> God didn't open the ark. They did you're trying to look into things maybe that you shouldn't right now with God because you're not ready for it. You're trying to say this or do that. Maybe you're not ready for it. And maybe the reason you're not happy with God is you haven't done the one thing required of God. Is repent. And truly open your heart just to Jesus and not to church. I see people think the church can help them. I've been doing this a long time. And some of you in here know what I'm talking about. Some people come to a church so that the church can take care of their problems. You still haven't found the Lord yet. You're, and I hear people say, well, I'm not going to church because it's got hypocrites in it. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're all hypocrites because there ain't one of us in here perfect. We all want to do the right thing. Amen. Yes. But at times we don't. Thank God for Jesus yes. and His mercy and grace. You see, the great thing of the Christian life is not that I'm better than anybody, but I have a Savior that's better than anything. Amen. And that Savior can help me even when I fall down. He can pick me back up and get me back on the right path. Amen? I've done it. I've failed. Even as a pastor, I have failed God, but there's a God in heaven who loves me, who has a purpose for me. And just like Job, just like Noah, just like Jonah, guess what? He's got a fish. He's got a problem. He's going to come in and wake us up. I love the story of Jonah. Was, when Roy and Melanie was here for the spring roundup, he was really talking to me about Jonah. And I said, well, you know that the Ninevites, they worship the, the fish god. No. And I said, what do you think he spent old Jonah out there on a fish? I said, couldn't you see them people out there on the beach worshiping them fish gods and then this fish comes up and burps real big? <laughs> and this dude walks out with seaweed in his hair? That's like Shazam, Bubba. Did you see that? <laughs> they got down. We're going to listen to this dude. God has a sense of humor. You know? I remember the first time I saw a guy preach on a horse. I said, now that's cool. 
And then what happened to my life? I've been all over the country preaching on horseback. But, you know, God is cool because God has a sense of humor. But God loves us so much that as you look at this God in the Bible here, He's the same true God. But the great thing is the question was asked, who is able? Those people are sitting there saying, this is devastating. And this is what lack of understanding does. It kills. It destroys things. Because we do things not knowing why, what if we should do it sometimes. Because we don't know God really. And that's why sometimes before we do anything, we need to just stop and count the cost. I mean, I remember when I went into the ministry out of the construction company, and I was very well-to-do financially, and I was sitting there, and here was my reasoning. Well, Lord, I have two little kids. How am I going to take care of them? I've got a mortgage. And it's like God said, stupid. You're just stupid. Because I've only been a Christian for five years and he's asking me to give up everything I got and follow him. And I started reading about old Peter and then I saw three years as he was following Peter, he denied, the fellow is, he denied it. And I realized something, Peter wasn't saved yet. But I am, what's my excuse to say no? And then I saw this old boy had an opportunity to follow Jesus and he gave Jesus the same excuse. I've got this stuff in the world in my way. And here I am a Christian and I still had things in my way of God. I went to church. I tithed. I gave extra money for programs in the church. You know, I could afford to do that. I took care of my family well, everything. And now you want me to give up everything that I have? You see what I just did? That I have, as a Christian, I hadn't given everything that I had to Him. I wanted my soul saved and my feet on the pathway to heaven, but I was still trying to control my destiny. And God says, I want you to give up everything in this world. And the only thing I could think of was I really allowing the world to lead me the wrong way as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And He wants to take all this because He loves me so much, this old cowboy construction guy, that he wanted me to give up everything because he had something better for me. But the question is, would I heed his voice? See, we're all sometimes at this same place these guys are. The curiosity of whether or not I should peek into something with God, I should or not. I should I do what he said? What? Should I go against it? They were told not to open that. That's right. But they took a chance. And thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And as we look at this today, so many of us, you're taking chances that are going to lead to death. Romans 6.23 says what? Well, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal, Eternal life. <clears throat> I, I've been doing this a long time, and I'm an evangelist by, by calling. I'm a pastor where God sends me to, to build churches, strengthen churches, encourage churches. But my heart is evangelism. I love to travel. And as you know, I'm, my windmill cowboy ministry I do, I'm doing five crusades this year. I'm going to Harrison in May. And i got some other places that want me to come and preach and encourage their churches. i got singing groups going with me. We're going to go out there and preach the gospel. But God's telling me to preach to the church because the church has gone astray. God says we have built a church in the image of man and his ideas and we have missed the church. The ecclesia, the assembly that Jesus created, that hell cannot tear down. The gates of hell cannot what? Destroy it. Hell is destroying our churches because too many men's ideas are in the church. We've got to get back to Jesus. And so, as we do this, we're seeing that here's some people right here that were excited about the presence of the Lord and they mishandled it. And it destroyed people's lives. And if we're not careful, we're mishandling God in our churches. We're saying God said it was okay to do something that He didn't say to do. We're doing things that are unholy and saying it's okay. And God's got a place in the passage of Scripture where He's going to talk to us one day and He's going to say to us right up to our face, You said I said what? And I don't want to answer God for saying something that's wrong. So I'm, not, I'm just, I, I in my own discipline, I'm going to stay right with the Word of God. I've got to because... If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Amen? Amen? So what does He say is right? Obedience. 
obedience. Turn with me to Romans 6 real quick. As we get in, for just, I want you to see a few things that God has said through the great apostle Paul. And I want you to see it, just a few verses here because I, I want to go to another passage of Scripture too today that kind of talks about this. Sin is sin, isn't it? And a lot of times we don't understand what sin is. It's, it's, it's saying a cuss word sin. I've heard a guy say, I don't take the Lord thy God's name in vain. I learned a long time ago, this may shock you if you're maybe an immature Christian today, but saying GD... I thought it was a cuss, but I found out in seminary it was a prayer. You're asking God to damn something. Taking the Lord's name in vain is when I call myself a Christian and don't follow Him. That's vanity. Saying that you're going to follow Jesus and you get everything else in front of Him. That's vanity. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. And I thought, wow. Wow. That's pretty scary right there when I think about so many people today in the world call themselves Christians and they live no evidence to prove it. That's pretty scary, isn't it? Because that's a commandment. Now, if I break that commandment, what's that say? If I call myself a Christian and I don't practice faith that Jesus told me, you know, one of the things I was a real stickler on is when Jesus said, teach all, the, teach all that I commanded unto you. One of the first things I did is I did an in-depth study in school to all the commandments I was taught to do. That there's over 120 commandments Jesus taught. And I was like, good Lord. Because I was thought it was 10. Well, he said the 10 are fulfilled when you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. Boom, those 10 are fulfilled. Right? John 13, 34, 35. A new commandment I give unto you. So then you start looking at, you know, gosh, I started looking at all the commandments that Paul preached. Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 has 22 of them in it. Just chapter 5. And you all remember when we did some of those studies here on Sunday nights and you all were like, my gosh, we started finding all these teachings that Paul and John and Peter came back and said, these are commandments of the Lord. If you do them, you'll be a good minister. He told Timothy that, right? These are not suggestions. These are called commandments. And that's why you go to church. Is your pastor and your teachers in the church are to equip you. As Ephesians 4, 11, you've got that office there. And they are gifts given to the church to equip the church for the work of ministry. And this is what I'm getting to today is the church is so quiet. One of the things I have, you know, we have questions about, we pastors, I have 63 on my phone and every Sunday I have prayer with 63 ministers. Starts at 6 o'clock in the morning. My wife will sit there and see me and it's after 7 before I get done. I do that every Sunday morning. That's a ministry I started because I love ministers and I want to I want to be a minister's minister. My wife says I need a director of missions job. I'm serious. She thinks she says you'd be an awesome associational missionary. You love ministers and you love doing outreach ministry. You'd be good for that. And maybe one day I'll do that. But right now while I'm here, I'm planted. I'm doing the work God called me to do here. But I'm still doing that ministry just because I love them. And this cowboy ministry that I do on the road is to help pastors, encourage them to bring revival in their church. And as you know, our church is going to help Crooked Creek Cowboy Church in Harrison on May 5th because I love Jimmy Dale, the pastor there. He also pastors a church in Jasper. He pastors two churches and works a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Those guys need picked up. Amen. And so our church is going to go there and encourage that church. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Yes, and what are we going to do if 500 people come to Jesus that night? We're going to help that church get them equipped. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so, as you look at the problem that's holding us up in our own individuals' life are the sins that we're tolerating and saying it's okay. When Apostle Paul says, what shall we do? Verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, certainly not, or God forbid. We've got to come to a point. I mean, I've been getting these deals that, you know, and I told you all about where I stand about ordaining women pastors. No. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but I can back it up. Now, if I couldn't back it up with the Word of God, I'd have to... Okay. But none of you ladies can be a husband. 
Well, I think today you can if you want to be. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Stacy, we got to have a talk on this one. Do we have to change our theology here? Never mind. That's Brother Stacy. He's our associational missionary. Welcome him here today with us. Amen. Amen. And so, he says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's the question. I don't think all of us die. I think we come to a point where we're, and then we start flopping around. Wait a minute, I'm not ready to fly. I'm not ready to give it up. Like in fish, you get them out in water, and they lay there, and you go to grab them, and that sucker will start flopping and slap you in the face. That's what we do to God. We start slopping around here, and we'll slap God and say, I'm not ready to give it in yet. But I did what, I let you catch me. I let you bring me in the boat, but I'm not willing to submit to you. I don't want to be set at your table. That's a good fisherman's story, isn't it? Man, I could go to the lake and preach that one. Yeah. So, or do you not know that as many as you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Do you understand that? The symbolism? I've died with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who liveth in me. Now, it's a good thing that we don't have to quote all that while you're underwater because we stuttered, you might drown. But, You've been raised to a new life. Look what he says. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead. Amen? Amen. Okay. He was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Amen. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly. Guys, look at that word certainly. This is confidence. This is encouraging right now. Certainly. Look what he says. What's it say? Somebody read it to me. We also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. That means that's a new life. You know when Jesus stood up, resurrected from the dead, he didn't have any blood in his body? Because he was alive in the spirit. And he promised you another a helper. The Holy Spirit. Now I know in Acts 2 he said repent. Every one of you. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, if it comes in that order, then that's how it comes. But I know this, that when I died to live for myself and I came to live for Christ, there was something that got a hold of me that changed my thoughts. I had to wrestle with it for a while. That's what discipline and discipleship is about. That's why you need to be involved in your church so that you can grow. And your understanding. So many people today are so ignorant. Not stupid. God called me stupid once. Because I knew better. My grandpa used to say, we're going to get back road on us. And he'd take me for a ride down the back road in the truck. And that was not a pretty thing because I got my butt with. Because I was stupid. But now when I was ignorant, he took responsibility. He said, I should have taught you better on that. And I'm sorry. And I took that to my children. I'll, I'll tell them, i say, this is what you're, we're doing. And this is what I expect from you. And here's the thing. If you don't do it right, you're going to get your butt whipped. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Because they knew what was expected. They knew how to do it. And if they didn't, they knew to ask. I mean, y'all are afraid to ask God sometimes because I heard a guy say one time, the stupidest thing I've ever heard it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. After about three times of my butt getting on fire by grandpa, I learned that that was suicide. And I learned from God that I don't even, uh-uh. To me, that's disrespect. That's disrespect. If I know to do something right and I don't do it thinking I maybe I could get away with it, I'm a liar. I'm disrespectful. And I'll never forget Grandpa looking at me one time and he said, Son, why are you so hard-headed that you will not just do what I told you to do? And in his eye, I saw a glimmer of a tear. And I thought, this is my step-grandfather. I didn't have a father. My step-grandfather did nothing with us. But his father took an interest in me, and that's how I became a cowboy, because he was a cowboy. And the way I dress is in remembrance of my grandfather every day. 
So now you know why I look the way I do. I do it in respect and remembrance of my grandpa. Because he was the only man who taught me respect and taught me to be something. He said, God gave you a million dollars and a lifetime to earn it in. You work for a living. You beg. Boy, I mean, he, he made a man out of you. We need some grandpas like that today, don't we? You ever value how much being a grandpa is to your grandkids today? How you need to be a man to those children? Not wishy washy. I saw that tear in his eye and that made me stop and think for a minute. There's something in his eye that's making me think about something. I saw that for the first time. Grandpa's doing this because he loves me. And he didn't have to love me. He chose to love me. And then when I came into a relationship with the Heavenly Father at the age of 28, 1991, April 28, 1991, I found a Heavenly Father that loved me enough that He gave His only begotten Son for me and that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I realized for a moment, I want that everlasting life. I don't want to die and go to hell, do you? But then I had to come back and I had to look to God and I had to say, well, God, okay, there's a way that you say is true, but there's a way that so many others say that are true that are not true. I need to know the truth. And you know what He did? He put me in a good church with a good pastor. And that was the very church that God called me from the pews to the pulpit in. That's the very church that sent me to Bible college. That's the very church church that sent me to seminary and paid for all of my schooling that I interned in for three years. That's the very church that ordained me in front of 54 ordained men. I had it. Woo, what are you talking about? That was a strict church. Dr. Coppinger, a seminary I was going to, led the charge of my seminary, of my uh, ordination. And I'm going to tell you what, that was not a more glorious event. I remember that March 17, 1999, because the day that I felt the Holy Ghost come upon me like nothing before, I saw men of God praying over me. And it changed my life that these men of God stood for something. Amen. And they were not going to send me to pastor a church if I could not be approved unto God through their understanding of who God truly is. Right, brother? That's how we did it, didn't it? And then I meet a guy the other day that says, oh, we don't worry about those ordinations anymore. And I said, I do. And when I'm gone, you younger folks, you better not let someone in here that hadn't been approved. Right, Brother Stace? You see any of that problem today? Not too bad it does, right? But that's the key. And I'm leaving all to this. They looked into that ark because they thought it would be okay. And a lot of us are allowing things in our lives because, oh well, God understand. 50,000 people died because a few men said, oh, it'll be okay, let's just go ahead and do it. And that's what's wrong with church. We've all got to come in one accord and say, well, this is what the Word of God says. In verse 23, he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Now turn with me to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse 14, 15, and 16. I'm going to close out with this thought today. The question is, who is able? Who is able to stand before this most holy God of Israel? They realized none of them were able. None of them were qualified. None of them could. But well, we got to ask ourselves today, can I stand in the presence of the Most High God today? There is a way to come to that. And this verse gives us a little bit of an understanding of that as we look kind of deeply into it. It says in verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Oh, come on. Can you say amen to that? Jesus, the Son of God. Say that with me. Jesus, the Son of God. Say it again. Jesus, the Son of God. Yes. That's what we got to start shouting. Let us hold fast our confession. What is your confession? You just confessed it. Jesus, the Son of God. And guess what? The ceiling didn't fall in on us. <laughs> You're still a breathing. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Got an intermission here with Tommy. You youth kids, listen up. Youth, Betsy. 
You always talk to my wife during church. I'm not that talking. Grandma, Grandma, where are you at? All right. You kids, you remember on Wednesday night when Katrina does the songs with motions for the Wednesday night live, big youth night we had around? Tommy needs to come out and do that with you one night. Don't y'all think so? Brother Stace, one Sunday morning, we're doing music. Tommy's up here doing motions. And I said, oh, but hold on, Bob. I made him come down here and do it for the whole church. And he did it, didn't he? Amen. Did y'all want to see that again? Yeah. Oh. I got an elder speaking tonight. I'm going to miss it now because he's going to get on me. So, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Right there, we have weaknesses, guys. Some of you use tater chips. Right? Pigs in a blanket. Whatever it could be. Cheeseburgers. Salsa's Mexican restaurant. Where's Mike at? Uh, that's the biggest burrito I've ever seen in my life. You know, it's worth going to supper on Sunday night as much as go to supper at Salsa's. And this deacon in training over here gets orders this burrito. And I ain't kidding, that thing looks like Moby Dick. <laughs> Anyway, back to my passage here. There's a weakness. Jesus sympathizes with you, buddy, because it looks like it hurts as you eat that big thing. Dave Nelson will be in amen in that one, I know. But was in all points tempted. Now, I'm going to stop here. Look at the word. Jesus was tempted, wasn't he? I was listening to Charles Stanley early this morning before I did my prayer time. <coughs> And Charles Stanley was preaching on the temptation of Christ when Satan says, if you'll do this, I'll do this. He brought out a very cool point. It didn't happen until he spent 40 days in conversation with the Father. Then Satan showed up. I want you to think about that. Satan's clever because he hadn't had anything to eat. He finds your weakness. And that's what he's saying right here. That we have a weakness. And I had one preacher one time in, in chapel class preaching. Satan's had, what, what do you say? 2,000, 2, he said, no, I have 6,000. He said, Satan's had like 6,000 years to get ready for you. And he pointed right at me like I did this guy right here just looking at me like I'm leaving. <laughs> Go wrong. And I thought, good, not. That scared me to death. But he says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. So don't sit there and think you're not tempted to stray. You are. You may be sitting there right now saying, I'm going to get out of here because that guy is crazy. Well, the devil's trying to tempt you not to receive the message that God has for you today. And you've got to say, get behind me, Satan. Say that. Get behind me, Satan. Amen. There he goes. So, but look at Jesus though. Yet without sin. Now that's something you've got to know for sure. This is a foundational thing to me. We need to know that Jesus Christ never sinned. Because if He did, He couldn't be the sacrifice for our sins. Now there's people out there preaching that He was married to Mary Magdalene, that they had kids. And, they, and I'm just like, are you guys nuts? Yeah. You see, there's all this doctrine and all these people that are not getting equipped, they're being, they're being just taken away by every wind of doctrine like it says in Ephesians 4, 14 that, that they must be equipped so they'll stop being children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's why you're going to have to make a choice in your life to quit attending the church and become a part of the church and get involved in the church. Because we live in times that are exciting to me. I heard people say, well, wouldn't it be cool if we lived back in the Bible times? But, but we're in the Bible times right now. We're in the, the last days. And it's exciting because we're seeing prophecy from the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah all the way to the apostles coming to pass. And it's exciting to me because it encourages me that I know I'm on the right side of this. Because he said it way back then, and it's happening. And guess what? We win. So I ain't worried about, you know, what it's going to do if they do this cryptocurrency. It's going to happen. There's all 
kinds of stuff they're doing. They found out that the COVID thing was the link to see what people would tolerate by the government. And now they're doing the crypto design. And then the crypto deal is going to put a chip in your hand so that all your money is done by regulation. You think I'm crazy? I watched it on the news this week. But guess what? <laughs> I ain't going to take it. How you going to live? My faith in Him. All these people that are getting scared, what are we going to do? You know what? You better be careful because if you're not following the one who knows what to do, you're going to go the wrong way. In the last days, there will be a great falling away. That means that they were with it, but they allowed the things of the world to fear, fear moved them away from God. We need to pray. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Yes, Lord. Right now, I don't know what you're dealing with, what you're going through in your life today, but as we continue in this study next week and in through Resurrection Sunday, it's going to lead us to this morning. I was in prayer and I'm like, where are you taking me? It's, it's going to be Resurrection Sunday. Now the Lord says, I've got it all figured out. You just do what I told you. Okay. And I believe that God, you know, we had a great spring roundup. Great, many of you got fired up and revived. That was our first revival that bar none ever had. We just kind of kept everything in the house. We didn't advertise great big about it because revival's got to begin with the church. Yeah. We had the preachers come in and singers had a good week a couple of weeks ago. And I believe that there's something afire here. But if we're not careful, it's going to become so powerful, you're either going to have to step into it or you're going to push it away like the Philistines did. It's so powerful, you're just going to jump and you're going to look into something that you're not ready. Because you still need some work here at the cross. <coughs> and it can devastate your life. So what I'm going to ask you today, you saw who Jesus is. He is our great high priest. And even though you're not perfect yet, He is. And you're not going to get perfect until that day you go be with Him. So get that lie out of your head that you've got to be perfect. But get the thought put in your mind and the mind of Christ that I need to be obedient to the will of my Father. And do what the Father's asked you to do. If you're here, I ask you to bow your heads. Remove your covers, please. And I ask you to ask yourself one important question. Will I go to heaven when Jesus comes? Will I go with Him? Because I believe He's coming soon. I believe it could be any day now. Are you really going to go? Are you willing to gamble and bet your life on a decision you made years ago can you look back at your life and see fruit that can only come through a relationship with God, of the Holy Spirit? Are you witnessing to people? Are you sharing Christ with people? Are you telling other people about Jesus? Or are you just a church attender? You're just a spectator, not a participator. You need to get find you a church home and you need to get focused and you need to see today I'm going to start outright. And don't let the devil sit there and shame you today and say, you know what, you're not worthy. None of us are able to stand before this Most High God that we saw today. But through Christ Jesus the Lord only can we enter in because of what He has already accomplished on that cross. And if you've come to the cross of Jesus Christ and you've confessed your sin before Him and you've asked Him to forgive you for your sins and plead the blood. I, I talked about this. You plead that blood. The old Lord cover me, cleanse me with the blood of Jesus and make me white as snow. I surrender my life to you to serve you all my days. Come, Jesus. Come, save me now. Deliver me. I will follow you. If you need to do that today, right there where you sit, just raise your hand and say, Dusty, I'm ready to take that step for Jesus today. I'm ready to be. There's one. Is there another? Is there another here today? You're ready to take that step. And you say, well, Dusty, I've never prayed that prayer. I'm asking you, are you ready to take that step to get serious and follow Jesus? Not join our church. I'm talking about following Jesus. Is there another? Anyone else? There's one that's raised your hand. 
Anyone else around the room? You're ready to make a decision today for Jesus. Okay. As Brother Bob starts playing, this is our invitation here today. Maybe you are a member of this church. Maybe you're looking for a church you want to join. These altars are going to be open. And you come. And you talk about what you need to do. Or you need to turn back to God. You need to get some things worked out. You come. As Brother Bob leads us, you come right now. Whatever you need, just come and pray.
necessary visitors. I'm glad you're here. Be sure and stop by the welcome wagon if you didn't. But we are thrilled with your visit here. We pray that you come back. So we've got other things going on today. We're not done yet. First, the veterans are going to meet out here right after church service this morning. So if you're a veteran, come out here and they'll get you to tell you what we got going on. We're going to have round pin Bible study right up there in the chuck wagon. Stick around for that. The kids and the youth will meet with Katrina. We're going to have an elders meeting at 5 o'clock today. Right? 5, five o'clock today. So it'll need to be short and sweet because we're going to have a memorial service at 6 o'clock for Susan's husband, Harvey. And so come out tonight and just uh, celebrate the Lord with us for that worship service tonight at 6. Monday night, we'll have Monday night rise. Lift, rise, fire. <laughs> These catchy names, Stace. They get me all the time. I thought maybe he was vying for your job there, too, when he said something about being his... Did you pick up on that? Yeah. Oh, it's, you know, I picked right up on that. The Association of Missionaries here. He's vying for a job. But anyway, we'll get back to that. We're going to have Monday Night Fire. And if you've watched that, you know that it is fire. I mean, it's awesome. So watch. be sure to watch that. Go back and watch the previous ones. Steve if and you Lindy's have. on it this week. Who is? Steve and Lindy Bartley. All right. Steve and Lindy. That's awesome. We're going to have Monday Night Bible Study one more time at the Tedders at 6.30. Next week will be at our place. Or next month will be at our place. Tedder's tomorrow night. Tuesday. What we got going on Tuesday? Church in the dirt. Looks like the weather's going to be much better this week. And so that's at 6 o'clock. Come out for that. Wednesday we'll have our, our 11 o'clock service. Our Silver Spurs and Brother Ken. There's a good turnout for that. Come out. If you've got time to come out and worship during the day, that's 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Then we'll have our youth and our kids on um, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. We had a great time this last week, too. We had some, some kids that are here this week and this Sunday. We thought, we're glad y'all were here this morning. Got a couple people I want to mention. Um, a couple to add to our prayer list. Terry Haley's aunt. Her name's Barbara Hampton. She's had a massive stroke. She lived down in Benton. But he's asked for prayers for her and that family, Barbara Hampton. Also, uh, James Gilliam, his funeral is today, if y'all know him. So just pray for that family as well. Candy's friend, Bill Fredrickson, he's on our prayer list, but he's in the hospital not doing well. So just, if you would, take a minute and pray for Bill Fredrickson. And I thank you for the prayers for Luke, my stepson. He, uh, they determined it wasn't his heart. He was had, got a pinched nerve in his shoulder or neck. And so that was a good, a good thing there. Good thing. All right. What else? Sir. That's right. Glad he mentioned that. Potluck tonight. So bring something to eat. We like to eat. Desserts are good. All right. What else? Thanks for mentioning that. Oh, there he is. Yep. All the victims in Alabama and Mississippi that are several that passed away in the tornado. So yeah, pray for all of those that were devastated by the storms in Mississippi and Alabama. Yeah, exactly. We have a team with disaster relief that's going to be heading out to help with that. And uh, we're, 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 all right, so we'll add that to our prayer list as well. The White River Baptist Association has a disaster relief team that actually goes and helps out with those. So we'll pray for that as well. Thank you. Amen. All right, anything else? All right, let's close out. Lord, we are so thankful for today and just uh, the ability to open up your word and just study it and read it and listen to it. And Lord, it, we know that it affects us and it changes hearts, Lord. And Lord, I pray that uh, we just continue to seek you and where we show our obedience to you in all that we do, Lord. We can't just be half-hearted at it or just do things that we think is okay, Lord. It has to be of you. I pray for all those that are on our prayer list, Lord, each and every one of them this morning. I pray for their salvation. If they don't know you, I pray for health. I pray for spiritual lifting. Just, Lord, you know what's going on with each and every one of them. And Lord, we lift all those up that have been devastated by the storms in Mississippi and Alabama. And I just pray that your glory is shown in all that. Because looking at the pictures, it's hard to watch when it's devastation. Lord, but we know you are in control. 
And Lord, I pray for a healing of that land. I pray for a healing of our country. Just continue to let our church seek you and all we do. Bring us back tonight. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.